We're recording. Perfect. Um, so as I was kind of mentioning, uh, we have staff from various divisions and other departments uh, and different disciplines. So hopefully we can answer questions that come up today. If not, we'll do some research and always get back with you. Uh, but really at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Devin and Floyd Art. to facilitate this conversation. So. Artie, I'm sorry. Artie, I don't know. Is there a hand raising on this? I didn't see it. Um, we're just really going to do it kind of like you just did, where you just uh, unmute yourself and say, I have a comment. Um, would you mind just introducing all the staff who are here as well, just so we know who's who's on the, on the web? Uh, sure. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, so most of you know me, uh, so I won't get into too much uh, introduction there. Uh, Devin Levins is on. He's our administrator of special projects. Uh, he does a lot of placemaking and uh, you know, um, kind of projects like that. Uh, we have Floyd, who is the head of our uh, design works division. Uh, you'll see his hands, uh, but probably not his face on this meeting. Uh, we have Jake. Uh, yeah, Jacob Fortunus is on. He's GAF tech assistance. If you're looking at the the participants, uh, he is in the comp plan division. Strong background in transportation planning, uh, and he's providing tech support for this. Uh, we have John Reddick from growth management. Uh, we have Laurel Hob ha Laurel Harbin from special projects. Uh, MJ is with us from the land use division. Uh, Mindy Mormon is our urban forester. I think that might be it from a staff standpoint. If I miss someone, uh, feel free to kind of go in and introduce yourself. Okay, it looks like I got everyone. So uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, yeah, so at this point, I'll just hand it over to uh, Devin and Floyd. Jeff, it looked like you had your hand raised on the thing. Was there anything you wanted to say or did you have something there? No, no, it's, I, I was just trying to demonstrate for Wendy that, I mean, that, you go to the participant list and there is a hand raise function, Wendy, if you want to do it. Uh, I'm just not, this is not as nimble in my, to me as the Zoom platform. So I'm trying to, un, I was trying to undo my hand, but it wouldn't go away. So uh, that's cool. We're, we're, we'll, there's only really, I think there's three citizens on right now or four, sorry, we got four citizens on right now. So between us, we're going to have a good open conversation. It worked pretty well this morning. Um, uh, things, does she want to jump in? I'm actually going to turn it over to you guys, but. For one second, what we're going to do is we're going to pause and we're going to have one of our tech assistants bring the map up as the main screen. So that way we all get to see the map as we're talking through it and then we'll all be at the bottom. So um, is that what you guys are seeing right now is the map? Yep. Okay, I got to yep. change mine. I was in a different view. Okay, perfect. So now what we have is everyone here, is everyone familiar with Wilani um, and where this is located? Because I can get Floyd to go over that real briefly, just kind of show the boundaries uh, if that'll help just to kind of set the stage. Well, I'm very familiar with it, so I don't need it. But if somebody else does, that's fine. Okay. Well, do you just want to show real, real quick, just the boundaries of Wilani? Sure. Can you show uh, yeah. This is I ten. Yeah. This, this, uh, this black line here is the overall boundary right here. Uh, this is I ten right here. Interstate right here. Uh, this is uh, the Crump Road kind of trailhead at this far end over here. Uh, this is uh, the Edenfield, uh, not, uh, I take that back, not the Edenfield Trailhead, the Thornton Road Trailhead right here. And the Edenfield Trailhead just off this map here. This is, you know, Miccosukee right here. And of course, the Greenway is uh, basically, you know, you got this area here. And then you got the portion of the Greenway that comes out like this. Right here, and this is where you kind of cross the Greenway at one point, and you cross again right here. This is Miles Johnson Road here. And uh, this is a potential area for the future interchange or overpass or whatever, you know, kind of this area right here. Uh, this is Buckhead over here, Buckhead neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, so does that kind of make it uh, kind of clear? This is Robert and Mumford uh, School right here in this area. Uh, this is Shamrock right here. So does that kind of make it pretty clear for everybody? Yes. Okay. So. One of the things that we like to go through on this is, you know, this map, everyone's kind of seen the map, but it may be good for us to have Floyd walk us through the map. Then, um, yes. Then, I'm sorry, before we get into the details of Nicka Suki, um, I keep hearing people say that the city owns a piece of Wolani. 
Is that correct? And if so, where is that in relation to what we're looking at here? It's down here. Okay, thank you. Can you guys see this? Yeah, close enough. Thank you. Okay, it's all this property right here. I'll go ahead and just outline all of it. And about how many acres is it? Does anybody know? 500 ish. Thanks. Okay. Um, and as we're going through it, if you if you want to say if you may be muted, so just be sure whenever you go to speak that you just unmute yourself because we do have someone uh, in the background. If there's a lot of noise or a lot of static, they're just muting just to keep it that, uh, down. But feel free to jump in at any time. Floyd, do you want to talk about a little bit about where this map came from that we're looking at and kind of what was thought about why this map was put together, and then that'll lead us into some conversation. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, when we put this map together uh, a few years ago. It's basically it's the kind of request we get all the time from citizens. Someone has a piece of property, whether it's five acres, ten acres, or a few thousand acres. We get folks coming all the time. So hey, yeah, I got this piece of property. I kind of want to do something on it. Want to have some ideas. And so we call this our typical site assistance. So this is something we do for citizens all the time. Uh, this particular property owner, which everyone's familiar with, it came in. You know, obviously a larger piece. Uh, the first thing we did is basically go through and identify all the like you know the flood zone. You know the you know, sensitive areas that, you know, there's no way you could ever develop them kind of thing and just kind of take those off the map. That's kind of like the blue and the green. And, you know, that's like your 100 year flood, your wetland, some other environmental feature, things like that. Just took all that. So, okay, a lot of that has the water course in that type of stuff. So, okay, we take those off the map. Uh, you know, of course, mixing greenways here. Uh, we, you know, identified that, you know, right here where these stars are. These are pre negotiated, uh, you know, roadway. Uh, intersections or crossings, if you will. And that was part of the agreement when the Mikasuka Greenway was, you know, when that property was transferred ownership, uh, these three locations were part of that agreement. So we marked those on the map. Uh, we went into the Greenway's master plan that we had, you know, which identifies this basically this perimeter loop that goes around the property. And so we showed that on the map right here. And then we just, you know, put it, and this is, and these road alignments in no way final at, at any, you know, any way, but we just generally showed like, okay, there's the blueprint project that there's you know, some type of overpass in this general area. So we just put it in the middle and then there's some type of connection to the north, whether it's here or you know, wherever it ends up being. And so we just drew just some kind of rough alignment here where the road crosses the, you know, the floodplain and wetland and stuff like that. These are existing dirt roads. And so we said, okay, let's line it up on an existing dirt road. You know, just as a starting point, because that seemed to make sense rather than just, you know, mowing a new path through the woods. Um, and then so we said, OK, everything that's left is kind of like more or less the upland. And so we just gave the upland area like a shade. If you have the, you know, kind of like the orange, the brown, and then the purple would be more like your mixed use and some of your commercial uses. And the other colors, these two colors would be residential uses, you know, whatever they end up being. And that's pretty much it. We, we left it, you know, really high level, kind of loose. At that area, this is just kind of a starting point bubble plan that we did, you know, the request of the owner, just like we do any other citizen. And that's kind of, you know, where we got to here at this point. And and with that, I, I say we just open it up and anything anyone wants to talk about or discuss from that point with the map, it's, it's open. Let's let's talk about it. And Wendy, go ahead and kick us off. Okay, I have a question about. Um, the level of detail in the map, I mean, maybe, well. Let me start. Let me, yeah, with a little detail. I mean, it's not to scale. The roads are not necessarily where they're going to be, except that we know where the intersections are with the existing roadway system. Um, I'm not sure what we as citizens are supposed to take away from looking at this map in terms of how this property is going to develop. I mean, I think a bubble map is a very good term for it, um, but I, I can't, I can't read it. I can't, I don't see what it tells me is going to happen there. And I know it's a separate discussion on the goals, objectives and policies, but I have similar concerns about that. So maybe you could start by saying, you know, what level of detail, you know, you think is appropriate on a map like this and why? Floyd, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, well, you just uh, agree with me. It is a bubble map. We ha we're not, you know, we we're not laying out a development here because there's no, you know, there's we're not there's not a development imminent at this point. I'd say at some point in the future, but 
nothing has gotten that far of the owner. And that's basically what we were asked at the time. So bubble map is exactly that. It says, you know, these are the areas, you know, that obviously everybody can agree and say, there's no way we can develop these areas that absolutely need to be set aside. So we said, okay, that's this right here. So that's, that's kind of a bubble. I uh, said, you know, what's left that you could potentially develop, but that doesn't mean you can develop 100% of this. This is the area that will include stormwater, regional stormwater facilities. It'll include, there will also be additional environmental features, you know, as Pam discussed or uh, pointed out to us. There'll be other environmentally sensitive areas within these color shaded areas that will have to be set aside as well, you know, when you get to that point in the process. But then, you know, so this is not 100% hey, we're going to pack it in development. This is just where you could potentially do something, but there's still going to be set aside, you know, as you get further into the process and you get to more level of detail. Yeah. Well, I guess I think it's very uh, good that the planning department is available to provide these kind of services to uh, the private sector, anybody who is looking for this kind of assistance. In this particular case, we've got about 4,800 acres that are subject to also some specific comprehensive plan, goals, objectives, and policies. Um, community facilities, you know, that need to be provided. I mean, I, 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 this may be sufficient for what the uh, property owner would like, and that's great. Um, but as part of a comprehensive plan amendment that lets us know what patterns of development we can expect to occur on these 4,800 acres. I, I don't see where that information is being provided. Artie, do you want to speak to that a little bit about what you guys would be providing as part of the comp plan amendment? Uh, yeah, I can speak to it. Some, um, you know, kind of first off, there's multiple layers and, you know, Walani is always a kind of a little tricky because it's a critical area plan. Um, typically, you wouldn't have the, a master plan adopted into the comprehensive plan per se. Um, but really, where a lot of the, the quote unquote rubber meets the road would be at the, the PUD level. Um, that's kind of the, the next layer. And really, the I guess the purpose of a master plan is to make sure as PUDs come in um, that they're coordinated uh, versus just piece by piece, this PUD, then this PUD, and they don't really take into each other into account. Um, that's kind of one of the, the reasons for having an overall master plan. Um, the PUD level is also where you start getting a lot more information. Uh, so at this level, you don't have the natural features inventory, um, but when you move into a PUD, you would actually have that um, completed by uh, a certified biologist and um, MJ and John Reddick are here if they have more uh, to say about that per se, but um, you start getting into what the, the traffic concurrency would be and what the mitigation would be and people will either scale back their development plans or, um, you know, you can pay in the mitigation. So you really start seeing development, the development plan take shape once you start getting into that next level of detail. Um, um, Artie, let me just ask one question and, and then I'll, I'll sit back for a while because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of struggling at the, at this sort of conceptual level. And, you know, we have talked about the master plan versus the critical area plan and some of the language that's missing in the comp plan. Um, but it was clearly the intent um, that somewhere, my 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 understanding is that somewhere before individual PUD level, that either in a critical area plan adopted in the comp plan or in a master plan adopted concurrently, that there would be that level of detail that is greater maybe than a bubble map, but not at the PUD level, as you're saying, where you really can kind of get into that granular decision where you can look at things like the connectivity of, of greenway systems, where you can look at the appropriate locations for community facilities, those, those kinds of things. So I'm a little concerned that it sounds like that step isn't happening because, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it sounds like it's not happening because the comp plan isn't really clear on how to do that. 
So I feel like we're going from something very, very, very general to something very, very specific without that interim guide, that intermediate guidance. Yeah, the uh, the comp plan kind of lays out the things that need to be addressed. Um, it doesn't necessarily get into a lot of detail about how much detail each of those items need to have. Um, if you kind of look at the, uh, the the other maps that are in other critical area plans or sector plans, uh, you know the other uh, maps for like the toe and the heel, uh, for example, or if you look at the southeast sector plan, the the maps of the Colin English property and the Southwood property, they don't get into nearly the detail that you see in the plan unit development, uh, the PUDs. Uh, they're really just kind of to guide what those PUDs look like. Jeff, I see you have a question. Yeah, uh, uh, Wendy, are you ready to, for a break? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's, it's not really a question. I mean, I'm not going to frame it as a question because it's more of a. I think it's more of a comment, and, and, and potentially some questions. So, from my perspective, what I would like to see, and and some of this can be captured on a map, but. And what I don't want to see is a series of PUDs that don't have a cohesive, well-connected, coordinated development plan so that all the infrastructure, all the trails, all the amenities, the roads, et cetera, are all considered holistically in advance of the development of the PUD so that when each PUD comes in, they do their share of the infrastructure, but it's part of an integrated, coordinated approach, not a series of individual, which is what, unfortunately, I think we've seen a lot of in Tallahassee individual PUDs that try to do things, but they're not connected, they're not interconnected, they don't take advantage of a lot of things that they should, building corridors for wildlife. So I think the master plan should provide the guidance for all future PUDs on the property, and it, there should be uh, plans for walkable communities that encourage multiple transportation modes, including walking, biking, and as much as I abhor them, golf court golf carts and things other other forms of transportation other than car uh, cars and that there should be a coordinated a plan to facilitate regionally the inf for our infrastructure needs stormwater being primary am among them this is a large development and it's part of a regional area and there's all kinds of issues that as we can see on this property there are a significant amount of environmental constraints and i know this property pretty well um having you know lived off of Crump Road for 28 years, just right across the street, and spent, you know, many, 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 many hours on the Greenway and, you know, through there. So I'm, I'm familiar with some of the issues as far as the, the water courses and Black Creek and all that. But there should be coordinated, uh, the plan should coordinate and facilitate planning of regional wide concepts and thinking. And there needs to be a regionally significant watershed level environmental framework that would have con uh, a significant amount of acreage set aside that would make uh, a series of well-connected conservation and preservation areas, wildlife corridors. And I know that, unfortunately, you know, it's easy to give up the, the environmentally constrained lands, but unfortunately, some of the endangered and imperiled species, per perhaps gopher tortoises, things like that, need the uplands too. So some of that has to be taken into consideration. And that there should be a regionally uh, significant network of trails that are connected this should connect to other trail systems in the in the area, so that ultimately we have all of our areas connected, kind of like what's done with with the uh, with the Phipps property and the Clay Gardens and Over Street, and then even if you want to take it across the street, you could say the Bridal Trail and Killarney Estates, which then would connect over to Wilani. So all of that can be done in a way that is coordinated and integrated. Um, I think that there should be some contemplation of what level of entitlements would be available, how many residential units, how much commercial industrial office space, and all of that. So there's sort of a conceptual, I understand that this isn't getting into the nitty gritty detail. This is having good planning concepts, uh, you know, uh, establishing an urban form for this area, if you will, that, that has a, a, a big, I mean, the, the, right, the right word is a master plan. It has a master plan. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to get into the detail of the PUDs, but it has to guide it and ensure that it's integrated, comprehensive, in a, that everything works together and it's been thought through. We don't go, oh, God, we just messed this up by, you know, now we can't even connect these lands. And this is the kind of things that this is an opportunity to do. 
And I really think it should continue for the rest of Walani, uh, you know, that's below I, I 10 as far as the integration of thinking about it. How do we integrate this and how do we make it cohesive and, and make it work together and not as individual subdivisions that we've done so much of in Tallahassee. So that's my, my first uh, set of thoughts. Yeah, I think those are really good comments. And I think just to kind of second that, I think those are all yeah, very good points. And I think one thing we have going for us is, you know, if you take the planning department as a whole, at least a third of us, if not a half of us are, are cyclists using the trails out here every week. You know, I know I was out at five this morning on the Phipps property and Redbug and all that, riding back to my house in the dark with my lights, and it was awesome. I even saw a big bobcat this morning. Um, so I think so. I think that's something, you know, we have a lot of end users, and I think that's something that I think everybody can agree to. And, that's, and you know, I think, you know, the regional stormwater uh, facility, absolutely. I mean, you're going to get, you know, better uh, water treatment, um, you know, better maintenance of the ponds, and then the ponds will just be, you know, prettier and better looking overall. And then over time, they'll actually turn into natural looking facilities rather than just, a, you know, the big mud hole with the chain link fence around it. Mm -hmm. So if we could, if we could conceptually think about the locations of some of these things based on, you know, the data in advance, and that would make it a lot easier for developers coming down the road who would purchase the property from the owners and, and have, and, and, you know, do PUDs or, you know, for their plans. But that would, you know, it would be helpful if those things were thought through, like, okay, this is where the stormwater, where, where the regional stormwater facilities would be, and we're, we're going to make sure we set aside that and not in, have that interfered with by purchases of properties, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure it'll be sold in pieces of some sort, and that's understandable. Um, and again, you know, personally, I have no opposition to the, to the development. I think the owners the owners have a right to, to to sell a property if that's what they choose to do, and uh, and I have no objection to that in principle. My my thing is, I just want to see it done really well. And 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 you know, it's a beautiful piece of land, and and you know, yeah, it would be great to keep it, but it's unrealistic. I I, I don't blame them. If I owned it, I might want to do something too. I'm not gonna, you know, I have no real philosophical objection to that. I just want to see it done integrated, holistically, comprehensively, well thought out. And, you know, and really I'd like to see us, you know, start retrofitting other parts of our community uh, in the same similar way. Certainly new areas give us easier opportunities than existing, but this is this is a big opportunity. We're, we're talking about what, about almost 9,000 acres. And, you know, it, I think it's unfortunate what happened in the canopy. I, I, I'm I'm certain that was not the owner's intent, and I'm certain that wasn't the original people, person who bought the property's intent. But the economy came in, and something else came along, and it got changed. But it certainly doesn't fit any sort of planning or thinking about modern development that that we would like to see. You know, so I, I'd like to see us mark out where's the stormwater going to go, where are the trails going to go, where you know, what other kind of things that we're going to have on here. Other than, just a, other than just a thin green line. Um, and I'd like to see, honestly, significant uh, land donated, or not donated, and I, I don't expect it to be donated, significant land dedicated is the word I'm looking for, for greenways and parks and, and trails. I think, you know, our community needs that, and I think there'd be a lot more support for that. And and personally, I mean, it's it's, you know, it's not, I don't think it's something that the, that the owners have to give. It's something that we, we should purchase from them. Uh, yeah. as, one, as, yeah. But one thing I'll touch on uh, your comment and, I think, and then also Wendy's comment she had before, just to give you all scale of reference. Can, can everybody see this pretty clearly? Just a, a little red dash here. Yes. Uh, yeah, my left finger here or on the, on the left is uh, that's zero feet. On the right, that's 5,000 feet. Each one of these little rectangles or squares or whatever is represents about roughly a thousand feet, and so that gives you uh, this, this map is approximately uh, an inch equals a thousand. You know, just for purposes of getting this on the video screen here, and so yeah, that, that gives you so that's about a mile. And so if you look at that compared to the rest of the property, that kind of gives you a frame of reference there. Uh, as far as like the comment about locating stuff, uh, that is something that we looked at when we were kind of laying this out initially. Because we looked at the lidar, the topo, like kind of where the low areas. Because you you probably end up some stormwater maybe around here, probably end up something else over here, and yeah, you start to like kind of locate things like that, and you and you start to see how they would start to work together. And then with that, that's where you could because you know they're all going to have a maintenance firm around them, so you, then you can start you know take the trails. And let's say you can do a little trail around a stormwater pond. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these are still other existing dirt roads to kind of cut through some of these areas. So maybe there's one here you can cut through there, maybe around the pond. And that's where you start to create that network. And mm -hmm. then also on the upland area, like I said earlier, 
let's just take this one for example right here. Let's say I sell this to you, Jeff, and you buy this for you know whatever you buy it for. And let's just say for easy math, it's 100 acres. If you could go to John and Growth Management and say, I want to develop this, you're not going to get to develop that full 100 acres, uh, depending on, you know, this is just a conceptual level. The next level, before we kind of get to the PUD and all that kind of stuff, we would do like the natural features inventory, the environmental impact analysis, all those type of stuff. Uh, they have to survey that, do a survey of the trees, uh, all those things to see what's out there on a really detailed level, have it in a survey CAD file. And then that's where you really start to get into you know, more detail level documents before you start working everything else out. And so it may be, let's say we, yeah, you know, let's say we got you know 20 gopher tortoise habitats out here. Well, you know that's obviously going to limit what you have, or you got some rare endangered you know, plant species, or pitcher plants, or something else. Yeah, you know, just throwing stuff out there. Um, right. So that that'll start to shrink this down. Then you got stormwater, you know. So you hopefully we get everybody to do like regional stormwater facilities, do this and work that out great month. And then, you know, you start to shrink down, let's say the density is, uh, I'm just purely throwing a number out. Let's just say density is three or four units per acre or something like that. And so, you know, you, you know, you start to get into like, okay, well, we don't want the whole site mowed down um, into large lots. So let's say we cluster everything down to like, maybe the development's limited to right here. And these are all small lots. And then the rest kind of get set aside for environmental features. There's, those are all the kind of that next round of detail after you kind of, you know, when, you actually start to get into that, you know, surveying it, seeing what's out there. And those are like kind of really the next steps of the process. Floyd, I think Pam has a question where she wants to jump in. Actually, actually it's Scott. I, I got yeah. your double registration. So okay. um, I'm not so worried about what happens in each of the individual little PUDs, 100 acres here and 100 acres there. But as Jeff was saying, we need a holistic plan to begin with. So yes. we need to know some of the natural inventory that's out there. Now. We need it now, we need it on the map so that the developers, when they buy those 100 acres, know what they can put where. If that plan is put there and then lines are drawn on that map, then maybe that's a little stormwater pond here, but maybe it's you know, the areas of where those are gonna be, that they're gonna be connected, that there will be some greenways between them, that's great. But if you leave it to each PUD, they're going to say it's the other person's problem. And I don't need to do that. That greenway is all the next guy's problem. He's going to put in the greenway. I'm going to avoid it. it, it it's naturally how it's going to develop. And so you need that detail, not the individual detail of whether it's going to be a cluster in housing here or something. You need the detail of all the infrastructure where you think it's going to go in the master plan and the master plan can be amended and changed i mean it's you know if something comes up in the future and there's a reason to change it because of what's on the ground or new things are discovered or burial grounds or whatever but you need that level of detail now and i'm sorry that it's going to be an effort to get that detail and put that on there but that's the point of it being in the urban services area. That's the cost of urban services, of getting that level of detail and doing that work. And it needs to be done now to have a holistically planned development. Yeah, I couldn't, I, I could, <laughs> one second. I couldn't agree more with that because that's kind of where I was going. I, I think what you're saying makes sense, but I don't want it left up to the individual purchasers. And I understand when it, when when a developer buys a piece of property, they're gonna they're gonna put a contingency on it, you know, based on them getting going through growth management and determining what they're gonna be able to do and all that. But having a natural features inventory of the property, and I guess the city is the applicant. I mean, you know, does that mean the city should pay for it? I don't know. Yeah. Should the so that's that's the city took that on for themselves. Well, then I guess that's their that's their liability. But we need we need a natural features inventory. So we so just as Scott was saying, we get a sense of the entire thing. We know what we can and can't do, and it really is going to help everybody coming down the road to do it in a holistic, comprehensive, integrated way. Anyway, that's that's what we're thinking. You know, thinking about. It makes, it's to the developer. It makes it much more plug and play. But I also, I mean. There's a level at which we don't need the NFI to be at the level that a PUD NFI would be. Right. But we need natural features on this map, as I said earlier this morning, that really identify what's going on. If there's, you only have one color that identifies all the natural features. There's a whole lot of natural features that are in the browns and in the purples. 
And we need to know that. And I, I think you guys have used these, you have this data before, and I think Fish and Wildlife Commission may have given you some data that will help. You. And, I, and I don't think there's anyone here that disagrees with that. Then let's yeah, do it. Just, 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 just to clarify. But the point here is, is to change and revise the master plan, not just to say these are good ideas and, oh, we should do this. No, the applicant does it before they submit the master plan for adoption. So if you take me, me on map, if, Pat, excuse me, I just want to know who said we absolutely agree with that. I, I lost track of that. Wendy, this is Floyd here. And okay, I think, thank I, you. Yeah, I think these are, these are like, like Jeff. Okay. okay. Yeah, let, let me just finish for a sec. Thank you. Uh, this is what Jeff and uh, the other gentleman that's on the phone, I think they're making great comments. It's, uh, they're absolutely right. If you have a property this size, before you move forward and you know try to like do you know sell it you know permit it whatever you absolutely need a master plan you don't want to take a piecemeal approach it'd be a disaster and uh, just to clarify when I was you know kind of just going through an example of this area earlier with Jeff I was in no way suggesting like hey let's just sell this off or whatever I think everybody here is in agreement just to clarify for for staff points and no, no nothing, you don't no have information gets out then you I don't think we're in total agreement with uh, <laughs> having an overall master plan. I think having some of the environmental uh, information at these areas, I think those are all absolutely great comments. Well, and then okay. we probably need multiple layers because I think Jeff is mm -hmm. right too about the integration of the stormwater mm -hmm. because this water crosses the boundary. And you already mentioned in the existing master plan, there's uh, perpetual drainage easement. Mm -hmm. That damn well better be on the map. Where is that? <laughs> we need to know okay. what that perpetual drainage easement is. Um, so, I mean, the next phase, and I, I know you don't want, necessarily want to do it immediately as we're just starting into these conversations. This is only the second one. But at some point, I would hope that staff would come back and there'd be a layer that says, here's our best guess at the high level natural features inventory. You know, where our populations are, um, what other habitats there might be. Um, more colors, so as I said before, more colors to the map. To just and then one that you see this morning, another layer that does the water courses and where things connect to the toe and the heel. And I think Jeff made a good point because we didn't say that this morning, that there's these, the heel is a thousand acres that's undeveloped and all wooded right now. It's got a lot of plantation on it, but, and somehow we're talking about doing the arch when there's still a thousand acres in the heel to do and 500 acres in the, the PUD of the city to do. So the phasing of when this development happens needs to account for that too. Yes. Um, but I do think there's at least two more layers here. There's a natural features layer and there's the water layer that helps us devise as you were drawing this morning, maybe it's soils, you said soils and LIDAR to help you identify closed basins and ponds. And that those maps then need to be referenced in the master plan with language about how the PUDs will have to conform to certain components of these master plans, of these layers. But I do think for the sake of the, of the commissioners, if the commissioner is still with us, is that it helps to have separate layers so that you can see them. And then at some point over, because you put them all in one picture, it's like impossible to read. Artie. So I'd like to know what else is behind all that purple. Artie, hearing kind of the concerns that they have right now, I mean, that makes a lot of sense of like worrying about it being pocketed neighborhoods instead of being one big PUD, but being like pocket PUDs. Um, has there been any discussions from the property owner about looking at a master plan? That may be more of a question for Robert. I know he's on, but is there anything on their end of where they've done any of that? I think not at not at this stage. Um, and I would agree that you know one of the things we want to do is make sure that we have the the level of detail and the the amount of information to ensure that the PUDs are well coordinated. Um, I think one of the things that we may have to kind of work through is what is the appropriate level of detail. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it would not necessarily be the level of the natural features inventory that you would have for um, actual development, especially if we're looking at something like the language that says phase two of this may not happen until 2030. Mm -hmm. uh, well, FEMA is going to update their flood maps sometime between now and 2030. Uh, you know, the trees that we we went out and inventoried today would not be necessarily in the same condition than, uh, you know, some of them that we would not necessarily protect today may be protected then, and some of the ones we would want to protect today may be rotting on the inside by then. Um, you know, different habitats may change, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't at least at some level address that. So I think we'll just have to kind of work through what is the appropriate level for this stage of the game, knowing that 
uh, things may change between now and 2030 plus. And we shouldn't be afraid of having that detail because things may change, but yet this master plan is not immutable either. It's a master plan. It can change too. And if the conditions are different, yeah. The only thing I would say is I noticed that the master plan for the tow was changed after Gizvini bought it and they matched, as far as I could tell, they matched the master plan to the PVs. Yes. That's not the direction it's going. Well, that's Partly that might be at fault because the master plan language was too detailed to start with. So you're right, we have to strike the right balance here. But I would say categorically, this master plan lacks so much information that it's very hard to identify a PUD that won't be consistent with it. And that's a big problem. So, so, so just a couple of things for me and then somebody else. But so I think what, what, what Pam was saying, you know, and, the, and me as well, but the high level natural features inventory, a lot of that information is available. FWC is willing to help from their end, uh, you know, and they'll, they'll certainly be glad to do it. You can get a lot of that information fairly easily. You probably have some of it already and just compile it. And then the stormwater, you know, the regional stormwater, you know, at least conceptually what that might look like. And then the other one, which I think is related to kind of the corridors and the natural features and the and the and the greenway and the parks and all that is, but really having a, a a significant watershed level environmental framework for this, you know, that would have a significant amount of acreage for a series of well connected, uh, you know, conservation and preservation areas for corridors for wildlife for water. I mean, they they work pretty well together. So some of that can be combined into, you know these quarters can have multifunctional purposes, including environmental constraints, but also making sure that the, that the species, uh, especially species of interest or, or that are imperiled, uh, are considered in the process. In quarters that connect other areas so that, you know, like bears need habitat to travel through, you know, and, the, and they do travel through there now, just making sure that that's not lost when we fragment the, the, all, all the, our habitat through development, we lose those corridors and they're really critical. Yeah, make sure you have one that heads straight for Kathy's property because that's where the bears are going to go. Yeah, that's a good comment. <laughs> Wendy, you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, is there, I have a couple questions. I'll try to keep them brief. Sure. Um, Floyd mentioned stormwater, you know, having to be accommodated. Then I heard people talk about regional stormwater facilities. So is what's the um, concept, I guess I would say, for stormwater management on this property? It, is it going to be regional, sub-regional, PUD by PUD, or? Uh, you would have to do a um, stormwater master plan for this. And, uh, and yeah, if it, that's what I was kind of illustrating earlier. And I'm not saying this is where they go. I'm just saying it's basically instead of leaving it up as the property to develop to just say everybody kind of does their own little pond, you know, as, as you know, as you, know, you move through the property. I, I guess the best example I can think of is like, if you take Southwood, for example, Southwood, they developed a regional uh, uh, stormwater master plan for the entire development for the entire 3,000, 3,300 acres out there. And then, you know, basically as, you know, property moved and developed or whatever, yeah, all the all the areas where they would locate stormwater facilities were already predetermined. They were kind of sized, uh, generally like a, you know just kind of a master plan, high level area, generally where they go, generally in size. And then you know they were like got into the level of detail design. That's similar to what you do here because like Jeff made a great comment a while ago. It's like all the watersheds, everything it needs to be connected. You don't need to have all these little isolated mud holes with a chain link fence around it. You need to have you know, all the stormwater needs to be, you know, put in ideal areas where you can, you know, make them large enough where you get great treatment, great water quality out of them. And then there, you know, everything's interconnected where you get multiple levels of treatment, you know, as, as water moves to the property, they're not all kind of cut off, isolated from each other. So that way it's an interconnected system throughout the entire thing. So that would be something that, you know, when it gets to that point in the process that I'm sure that everyone would want to ask for. I sounds great. I'd love to see it written down and, uh, in the, the master, master plan, plan. <laughs> I will say that the, uh, the master plan, <laughs> the master plan, the master plan currently does have there that says that prior to approval of the first PUD concept plan, 
Uh, stormwater water facilities master plan for the entire arch shall be prepared by the applicant and reviewed and approved by the city. Uh, who's, and the, on a little who's, bit more. The, who's the applicant? The first guy getting stuck with the PUD? Yeah, who's the or is it the city? Or it's the first person, the first developer. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be the first developer. It needs to be the applicant of the master plan, which it's is got to be. It's got to be somebody who's viewing the whole area. It can't be the first PUD. That's just that's not fair. Dumb. That, that, stop. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the first developer would agree with you. <laughs> what does that language mean? Marty, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I'd um, I have to kind of go back and look at the rest of the context of it. But uh, one of the things we can do is kind of make sure that it's clear. Um, clear well, would, we'd have to do that. So uh, the master plan needs to be the master plan for the water doesn't wait five, ten years for a PUD to come through. I mean, this is the master planning stage right now. And I mean, I know, I know, I know you didn't get the resources to do this already. But the applicant is the city, not the planning department. So, and I know there's no, I don't think there's a city commissioner on, on here, but the city commission really needs, if they're going, because they agreed with the landowner um, back in 2016, I think, that the that COT would be the applicant for this comp plan amendment and that they would do the master plan. And as Scott said, this is the cost of expanding the urban services boundary. It doesn't come free. Um, it's not just whoopee, we have more revenue. That's not what it's about. If they um, asked to do this this master plan, then we assume they wanted to. <laughs> I also think that if this were private developers, you said before, we get these applications all the time. Not for 4,800 acres, you don't. Not in our neck of the woods. Maybe in the rest of Florida, they see it. And when the rest of Florida, when someone comes in with a 25,000 acre plan, they do the master planning. And yes, then they go on later on to do greater permitting, greater details. But I don't think if this were a private no, if it were the landowner on their own coming forward with this, I don't think this would fly. So I think collectively here, we need to hold the city as the applicant to take the responsibility of yeah. doing a stormwater master plan and an NFI at levels appropriate for being able to say when a PUD comes in, whether or not it actually is consistent, that when it's all done, it'll be integrated into a functional community, a functional ecological and human community. And I, also, I do think to Wendy's point about whether the finish, Pam. <laughs> whether the stormwater will be local or regional, I think this is the exact thing. I think it was Floyd who just went through that whole great stuff about how it is greater and greater treatment. But at the level of regional planning, this is it. You put in an area where it can possibly show up um, and why. That means the soils and the topography. And then when the PUDs come forward, you know, the guy who's got the land that has the, the regional plan, regional stormwater facility, that's probably the appropriate time for a development agreement to assign how you're going to spread that cost of that infrastructure. But that infrastructure is going to serve much greater area than that PUD. So I know we're sort of preaching to the prior, but the point is, is that we probably need to get some city commissioners on here to understand that they are the applicant. <laughs> I think Wendy has a statement she wants to make as well. Go ahead, Wendy. Okay, yeah, uh, first, um, those care people, keep it roll people, sure. <laughs> what? I just want to also just preface that by saying I'm only I'm here representing myself. I'm not representing any group or any agency. I'm just here as an individual. But the other question I wanted to ask is um, there's been a lot of discussion about the natural resources and the stormwater infrastructure kind of stuff. But there's also a lot of stuff in the comp plan um, and in the amendment that talk about uh being transit friendly and achieving the 20 percent internal capture and i would just like to suggest that the level of detail that's being discussed for the infrastructure also needs to be addressed in terms of the land use um because one of my questions is you know presumably the density will be located where closer to your mixed use areas um, and that's where your transit facilities will be. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't see that depicted anywhere. And I think that that's part of what needs to be depicted in the, in the um, master plan as well. And things like fire departments. I mean, you can't just plonk them down anywhere. 
Um, they need access. They need a uh, large road and turn around large trucks and yeah, well, yeah, but somebody's going to get stuck with that in their I, PUD. I, I mean, you've got to sort of know about where it's going and which PUD it's going to get stuck in. I mean, these. So this that, is twenty five percent of the city almost eventually. I mean, it's going to need a lot of these things that. And, and, and normal and acre development. And what about school sightings for you know new schools that will be needed? So that, that goes to the accounting part that Wendy was talking about, the 20% captured. And then the schools are the schools are listed as sort of each as each PUD comes in, you do an assessment um, to figure out whether you need a school, which so somehow it has to add up. There has to be someone keeping track mm -hmm. at the top about as things come in, how are they fulfilling? How is the whole thing getting close to the 20%? Um, getting close to um, the threshold that's required for new school. And avoiding the de minimis yeah. issue. The where, death by a thousand cuts. Yeah, where we'll just do it N minus one size and then we won't mm -hmm. have to be the one stuck with it. And making it the person who goes over the limit is the one stuck building a school or a firehouse or whatever is inherently bad <laughs> way to develop. I mean, it's gonna be everybody like the penguins pushing each other at the edge of the ice flow. Um, and you need to uh, have it clear from the front that this is sort of the area where, you know, a fire department's gonna have to go near that nice little roundabout there for access, or it's going to go here, or the school is gonna cover the high density in the upper right-hand area or whatever. You've got to have that up front. And that's really how the master plan becomes a holistic uh, coordination between these PUDs. Otherwise, they become an uncoordinated free for all. Yeah, so I mean, this is where I would rely upon Artie and Wendy to provide us with language about in a planning and a plan how you create that gatekeeping, how you create yeah. finding out who's doing what and whether they're doing it right. And I've learned enough from both of them to know that you have to have locational standards. Yeah. So it's not like this stuff doesn't show up on a map per se about exactly where the fire department goes, but that as PUDs come in, there have to be location standards for it. So it becomes obvious which one is gonna have to do the yeah. fire station, which one is have to do the elementary school and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but also that, that accounting capacity. And I don't think at this moment there's anything in the master plan that accomplishes that. It sort of says you will do some of these things, but there isn't any way of figuring out how it's going to work out in the end. So I think that's a, and I, God love it planners, but that's the language that you guys got to come up with. <laughs> so you need, you need some thresholds that determine when things are done and when, you know, metrics that you can measure those thresholds against that, you know, as you, as you, as the population increases, we, we have to, you know, make sure that we have this incorporated into the planning, both from stormwater transportation, you know, all the infrastructure needs. And then, of course, you know, the environmental components of it and the, the, the preservation part of it, uh, it has to be thought through in advance as well so that it, it is done in a collective sort of comprehensive way. Just, just a yeah. yes, so thank you, Pam, but um, I'm sure the planning department can come up with that language just fine. We, we've got about 10 minutes left or probably about five minutes left until four o'clock now, but I know we started about five, 10 minutes late. Anyone have an issue if we go until 410 um, and then we call it at 410. That way we can finish the discussion up. Works, for, works for me. Okay. All right. Hey, uh, Deb, I got to actually, I'm sorry, uh, Pam, I got a question. If I can put you on the spot, if that's okay. Um, I thought that? earlier you, you made a great That's comment weird. about you know density and uh, and you know resident unit type and things like that. But we're, let's say we take this area here and we're talking about you know kind of transition to rural and and more urban and that type of stuff. And you know like if, and I just kind of want to get everybody else's thoughts. Like you know like let's say you had this area here and you got more this is more dense and as it moves over here, you start getting the you know like if you transition and it happened to go into larger lots. I think you made a good point. It's like, you know, well, if you do larger lots and everything's like one acre lots and stuff, it ends up just impacting a lot more area. And, you know, it'd be better to kind of cluster developments, you know, residential units, things like that in these areas, like on the smaller units and have more land set aside. 
Um, you know, on the flip side, if, you, know, you know, like a cluster development on the flip side, if, you know, there's been other proponents that don't really understand that cluster density mm -hmm. and have kind of beat us up on like saying, oh, well, we're just giving more density units when in fact we're not. We're just basically consolidating it to a smaller portion of the property and putting everything else in preservation. I wanted to see if you could kind of, you know, go over the, I think you framed it really well this morning. If maybe you could put that out there and kind of get uh -oh. everybody else's thoughts. I'm ready okay. to start on it. I actually think you just did it, but I do think it's just a matter of arithmetic, is that you just have to demonstrate to people that we have certain allowances for gross density, but that the total number of homes has to occur in a very limited amount of area. The footprint of the homes is small, so we don't have minimum lot sizes. Um, and I think, I, I was also thinking to, the, to Jeff and, and Debbie, uh, Jeff and uh, Wendy, and, I think there's at least, isn't there another member of the public we haven't heard from who's listening to us, I hope? Um, anyways, um, particularly for the uplands, the uplands, the uplands always gets, in Florida, we conserve wetlands and, and floodplains. And then the uplands is where we build. Well, I live in uplands. The Red Hills is uplands, and it's one of the most um, degraded land types in the history of the United States. And it used to cover millions and millions and millions of acres. And now there's you know a couple hundred thousand, maybe half a million, and, and some of it's called timbers controls. And this land, while it doesn't have the longleaf pine forest on it, it still has the upland forest. So these cluster housings, I think, are particularly important for preserving, to Jeff's point, wildlife corridors and things like that. Backyards, suburban backyards, are not an ecosystem. They're just a suburban backyard. Um, you yeah, know. so I have to, so I'll, I'll respond to that as well. <laughs> this is now in the urban service area. I don't want to see suburban sprawl. Yeah. And, and one acre or five acre or 10 acre lots make no sense. What, I mean, so this is not what we're doing. Here. So if we're going to have, if we're going to have significant conservation land and trails and all of that, that we, that's more important. And then we, you know, that the, well, the mitigation is that you get your density through smaller lots. You know, you determine what a, a what a fair level of entitlement for it is. How many how many square foot? How many residential units are there going to be? How much square foot of commercial industrial office space there's going to be? And then you 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 use the land that's available to to accommodate that so that it's a fair district. You know that the, that the owners and the developers get a fair amount of property to develop. But in return, we get a significant amount of property that's conserved, protected, and and useful for. Uh, the, the community writ large. So small, small clustered, tighter developments is what's needed. This is not the rural area now. This is now the urban service area. So I would not support large acres, any large lots, acre lots in this property whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, um, I do think yeah. so. So Wendy knows that I talked about this because she and I talked about housing a lot. Um, um, is that it's important if we do this housing too that we allow there to be a whole variety of types of housing everywhere. I don't think there should be a part of this town where there's large houses and a part of this town where everyone who does the services needed for the large houses lives in smaller houses. Um, I think this needs to be socioeconomically integrated, and that means that there's no place that's just single family detached. You have to make, I do agree that there should be some limitations, and there's differences between. Um, you know, once you get up into multifamily that are five to 10 units or multifamily that are 100 units versus quads and, and, and duplexes and single family, there has to be some difference there. But two previous comments about transit, you're not going to accomplish this very well because everyone is going to own two cars to live in this part of the world because regardless of what we say, the that intersection of 1.9 million square feet of traffic of an interstate is not going to be a game changer economic condition. We already have one on Route 90, and that one's not filled. We have one on the other side of I-10 and Capitol Circle, um, I-10 and, and uh, Thomasville, and that one's not filled. It's unlikely that these are going to be the place of high earnings, I mean, they're just not. Look at the future. We're going to have less office space because now we've understood with COVID how much we don't need quite as much office space for many jobs. We're going to have a lot of warehouses because we transport a lot more things that way now. We, we buy it online. So I don't think we can look at this place as having some sort of some sort of equivalent of the University of Florida, Florida, Florida State or the Mag Lab coming in and plopping itself down here. I mean, maybe, but that's unlikely. Um, that would then really support the levels of income that are necessary to live here if it looks like K 
canopy. And if it looks like a lot of what Clarn looks like, but Clarn Estates itself is not a bad example of some of that integration. It's still sort of um, too high grain. I think we need to have much finer grain, but, um, and I think by doing that, by creating the diversity of housing types, you might not get to affordable or low end housing, but you can get to housing that more than just the upper 20% can afford. And that means that this becomes a real community instead of an elite enclave. I think I said that this morning too. <laughs> but I promise not to keep saying it at each meeting. I'll, I'll sometimes somebody should just let me watch and not give me every other meeting. Yeah. When, Wendy, you like you have something you want to jump on? Well, yeah, this is more of a, of a background question, um, kind of following up on Pam's comments is um, there are some pretty broad ranges in terms of the allowable uh, development in each land use category. So, you know, residential is a very broad range and I don't have it in front of me now, but for the commercial, but has there been any uh, discussion or sense, and I have realized this is a very long time frame for this development, but what the nature of the non-residential development feasibly will be? I mean, are we looking at sort of traditional interchange? Are we looking at sort of gas stations and uh like, motels um you know what 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 do we expect to see is there any sense of you know what the market is calling for in the next five years of course it's, everything is so uncertain but presumably yeah. some has been given to that Floyd already either one of you want to jump on that I don't know of anything specific to this I was getting a lot of static on my end can you say it again Basically, when Wendy's asking, do we know what the market's going to call for in this area? Can we give her more detail about the, the type of uses that you might see within those land uses? Whether that's going to be for the commercial, would it be gas station type uses or what, what are we, what are we, anyone projecting or predicting? You're saying, I, I'm sorry, it's just, I'm, I'm, I don't know why y'all are breaking up, but uh, you said you're talking about the different types of residential units and commercial. Non, non residential. Non residential. The stuff in the big purple area next to the interstate. There you go. Yeah. What? What could yeah, that? This, yeah. This yeah. would be like uh, like Misty. Are you talking about this area and this area too? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. This, yeah. Uh, well, this would obviously be like kind of like mixed use. You know, it's, it's kind of interchange off the interstate. Yeah. Whatever it ends up being. So uh, no, these little areas here are. were kind of identified as you know kind of like because it, you know Blueprint proposes some type of north south connection. You know, somewhere wherever it ends up going and connected to whatever somewhere in this general location. And then Shamrock's over here. And so, so we kind of looked at this as like the area over at Boy, Malarn, good. Yeah, right there at uh, so so the the area of where they have the Ace Hardware, the gas station, and stuff like that. Yeah. This would be like an area kind of similar to that, you know, where it's like it's a small kind of neighborhood commercial. It might be a couple restaurants, maybe a pub, a pizza place, uh, maybe a little uh, convenience it's store, like uh, hardware, square feet. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Now, what's the big interchange? The big interchange, is that going to look like the Flying J truck stop? Amazon warehouses, what are the ideas that we're, it's like, it's almost 2 million square feet allowed. What is the future, economic future of interchanges to fill that with something other than Amazon warehouses and big box stores that is it no longer look work? like the truck stop west of town or east of town? <laughs> I, I don't think at this point, just kind of speaking to it, that we would know what that's going to be at this point. And especially yeah, with the idea. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it would be up. Then why are we permitting 1.9 million square feet? And we just really have no clue whether that's needed, going to be used for, or anything. Isn't that I, cool? I think you said it earlier. Best. You said it's a master plan that could be changed. So that would be something that if it wasn't what they needed, then it could be changed at a later date. Why don't we change it now? <laughs> but I mean, is there no way? I mean, look at Route 90 and I-10. You know, yeah. that's not built out. It's been there for years. Hmm? So I, it's, it's unclear to me. I mean, I think maybe we need to rethink what mixed use means and, and be a little more creative and look at other communities. Just because it's an interstate exchange doesn't mean it has to look like every other interstate exchange. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I don't think there was very much allowance for residential in this area, but maybe there ought to be more um, high density residential. Maybe this is where apartment buildings ought to go. Um, yeah, chime in a little bit. Um, go, Marty, yeah. So, so what we've identified in these areas are kind of like broad uses. So we say office, hotel, 
Uh, residential is allowed 20 units per acre. Uh, okay. That's kind of what our suburban land use category allows. So uh, that would hold maybe not like the really giant apartment complexes, but you could do some kind of moderate size apartments. Um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, a good point that especially given, you know, the situation we're in now where we're having these virtual meetings and virtual shreds and stuff, you know, whether future demand will be for more office space or not. Um, I do think that kind of the comparison to Capital Circle Northwest or the, the Mayhan uh, I-10 interchange are a little different. Um, largely because those are lower density residential areas out there, so you won't have the rooftops to support uh, quite the same level of non-residential development as you would here. I think as we're kind of looking at uh, kind of more rooftops surrounding this. Uh, but, you know, I think the point's taken that, you know, maybe we should look at, you know, how do we have not just a mix of uses, but an integration of uses. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of good examples of mixed use developments and maybe some not as good examples uh, across the state and across the country. And we can kind of learn from those lessons uh, and also like really address how, you know, how, how these things are arranged. Um, yeah. And then, you know, things like Amazon warehouses. I know, you know, Amazon used to be, you know, you order something and it shows up in a week and then they rolled out Prime and it's two days. And then in big cities, they're saying like the same day delivery, their ultimate goal is you know, deliver within two hours of ordering it. <laughs> so that's going to really change the landscape of how logistics work, how warehousing works, things like that. Uh, so instead of these very large distribution centers, you may have smaller things integrated throughout different communities. Uh, so they can you know, expedite the delivery of things. So uh, I think that's a good point and uh, something that we should should definitely look at. Well, maybe we should rethink the 1.9 million and expand it later if necessary. I mean, there's it can be done gone go both ways there, as you say. And as I said, it can be modified. So let's look at what's realistic there. I think. Well, I would say it's usually easier to take something non-residential and convert it over to residential versus having it shown as residential on a map and then try to uh, do something non-residential. <laughs> Businesses well, don't usually come out in arms against yes. people living near them, but people usually come out in arms <laughs> when you try to go the other way. <laughs> See, we're having trouble getting a piece of property converted from, from industrial to residential. That should be easy, you think, right? <laughs> and not always. Yeah, well. It's never easy. Change is hard. So we are at 408, so we are coming up on the hour. Um, just so everyone knows, we appreciate everyone getting on and everyone coming up onto this um, good meeting this morning. I think this is another good one. Like Marty said, there is a second part to this that rolled out this morning. Um, if you have policy issues or anything concerns you want to put into that, you can go. There's a survey portion. It is online and it's on the same site where you signed up for this meeting. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach out. And I know Artie's been taking direct calls or any of us that can help you. We all be happy to talk with you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're here to help and we really appreciate y'all's input. A lot of great comments. I'm looking forward to draft number two. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Artie. What three? Thanks. Hey, Artie, this is, uh, this is Rick. Hey, how, just wanted, how you doing? I just want to thank everybody again for, for uh, participating in this, all of our, our staff, as well as the uh, Pam and, and Jeff and Wendy and everybody else. I really appreciate it. I, I've got four pages of notes so far, uh, <laughs> and I'm getting started. So I, I, I'm, I'm intending to go to participate in almost all of these video conferences. So um, I think by the end of this, I'll, I'll have a lot of good information. This has been very helpful. These two um video conference has been really helpful for me so thank you very much go tell your city commissioner friends they need to be here they're the applicant <laughs> they are the applicant they need to hear some of this <laughs> hey Marty, can i ask one quick question about the webinars I, I heard this morning uh from cliff fail that he wasn't able to get on so how does it work like are did there is there a certain limit of people or how does how can you get added you know i i got a, a message from cliff as well um you know, he never actually filled out the form um, to register for any of them. Um, yeah. I, and on that form, it actually says, you know, if you 
need special accommodation or if there's a date and time that works better for you to, to fill it out. So uh, it would have been helpful if he would actually have just filled out the form and submitted it. Um, you know, it's, I sent him an email saying that we would, we're happy to add him to the one this morning and kind of the next one. And so, um, so you're saying you didn't even register. It's not a two step process though. You fill out a form and then you get emailed another, uh, the same information a second time. That seems odd, but that seems to be the way it goes. Yeah, well, you know, I have to send someone a link to, you know, you tell me when you're available and then I, I send you the link to the meeting. Um, so you have to actually register twice already. You, you have to actually, online. you tell them when you're available, fill out your email address, your home address, your zip code, all that. And then you send me and I get another mail that it says, says fill out your email, your address, and now register. So I have a feeling I'm registering twice. I, it seems a little yeah it, it is a little confusing i had the same concern but then the second time when it came back i saw that i was registered it's a little i think it's the system or not anything you've done specifically yeah, yeah, yeah. it is and i'll be honest part of the reason for that is um you know people across the country working from home and stuff have found uh instances of quote unquote zoom bombing and so it's a it's a oh. level of protection to make sure that someone doesn't quote unquote red sure that then you know blast our screen with pornography and obscenities and things like that so uh the first part is to let me know that i'm sending you the kind of you. when which okay. meeting to send and then the second part is so i can actually verify that you're the person <laughs> and not some bot or something so i yeah i apologize it's kind of a two-step process but it, it's really for everyone's safety and security Got it. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. One brief comment. Mindy, we didn't talk at all about the urban forestry plan or maintain topography. So I hope you come back to another meeting where we can talk a lot more about that. Great. Yep. I'm happy to yep. yep. Appreciate y'all's time uh, and, and, you know, staff and everybody and, and Rick for being on as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs> Good to see you, Wendy. <laughs> okay. Next. <laughs>